this subject, which I'm going to get into, uh, I might call the anatomy of assassination or the politics of assassination. Assassination is a big business. In fact, assassination is the business of big business. I've written quite a bit on this subject in various magazines, and for those of you that have managed to get past some of the pictures that occur in some of those magazines, you'll know that in November, issue of Genesis, I wrote on the subject of the Kennedy assassination. Uh, last, just last month, March, issue of Genesis, I wrote about international assassinations. And I have to write five months ahead of time. I have an article completed and in the mail on the 24th of March on assassinations in which I talked about the possibility of further assassinations in the Middle East. And as I went to the post office on the 25th with a newspaper under my arm about the assassination of King Faisal, I had the intention of taking the article back home and bringing it up to date. You see, it's a, that kind of a subject. What was your first thought when you read about the assassination of King Faisal? What, what goes through the minds of the perpetrators of assassinations? Are we again confronted with a young man that was a lone nut who kept a diary and friends on a grassy knoll down there in uh, Saudi Arabia? Or was the king killed by some sort of a machine or conspiracy that had other plans for actions in the Middle East. Mr. Kissinger had left the Middle East the day before. Mr. Mr. Nixon had tallied in Dallas until the morning of the assassination. So there's a theme running through these things that the king is dead. But what what is the meaning then of the controls that, that go through these things. In this case, the resumption of power in Saudi Arabia almost seemed to be a little too even, too easy. What had, what had really happened there, and I think what had really happened there will give us a picture of what goes on in assassinations, what the, how they are, how they come about, and then we can take that kind of a picture and begin to unravel some of the others, and we might come a little closer to the mark. Technically, what happened in Saudi Arabia is that the king's guard, the king's elite, was broken. Now, you can keep a man alive. If you don't believe that, read your history of General de Gaulle. Even in the deepest and darkest days of World War II, there were thousands of people who would like to have had a shot at de Gaulle. I remember after the Cairo conference in Marrakech, Morocco, Churchill was recovering from a bout with influenza and de Gaulle came to visit him several times. You can't imagine the security precautions that were taken in Morocco to keep the good general alive. I was in Lima, Peru in March of 1964 when de Gaulle came and captivated the country of Peru. Hundreds of thousands of Peruvians <coughs> filled Plaza de Armas to such an extent that they were pressing against the walls and trampling the trees. And yet, General de Gaulle, who <laughs> good many inches taller than I am, walked among these Peruvians that night with searchlights on him in that huge arena among hundreds of thousands of people and there wasn't a person took a shot at him because in the six months six months before he went to lima the people whose business it was to keep the gaul alive the guerrillas if you remember their term of endearment had thoroughly worked over the city of lima had combed every list for people in that city who might be anti-Gaullist, had provided them with resort hotels a long way off, and had made sure that when the general came to town, he would stay alive. What is it then that keeps these people alive? It, in every country, the king would not live if there was not an elite guard. And who trains the elite guard? 
the Vanell Corporation. <clears throat> it seems to me that there's a point to the subject which appeared just a little while ago in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and a great number of other papers to the effect that there had been a contract issued with the Vanell Corporation, and I don't have any idea what their corporate connections are, and the Defense Department of the United States, and the fact that the Vanell Corporation had signed this contract for the purpose of training, first of all, the National Guard of the Saudi Arabia, and National Guard there means more or less police, and the King's Elite Guard. I wonder which king they had in mind. Because when you control the elite guard of a country, when you train that guard, when you arm that guard, when you teach them to jump from an airplane at Fort, at, uh, Fort uh, in Georgia, Be uh, Benning, and in Fort Bragg, give them all kinds of weapons training and bring them down to Camp Perry in Virginia where there's a nice little resort, that guard knows how to keep a man alive as long as that guard agrees to keep that man alive. So I don't know whether the death of King Faisal preceded the work of the Vanell Corporation or whether the Vanell Corporation's contract began on the 25th of March, but it's awfully important because whether those men stay alive or not is the function of their inner guard because once you relax the guard, you open up a hornet's nest. A lot of people would like to control the bank accounts of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Dofar and the rest of them. And what keeps the king alive is not the election of the populace because they don't go through that routine over there. It's simply his guard. So this is a key to it. And the guard in many of these countries throughout the world where there have been so many coup d'etat, a euphemism for the work of mechanics or assassination. These guards for many, many years, and in my experience, more than 20, 25 years, I was in Saudi Arabia in 1943 on clandestine activities, is the work of the Central Intelligence Agency. And the people who let the contracts for the Central Intelligence Agency are called the Department of Defense. And then the people who do the work are called such companies as the Vanell Corporation or Air America or some of these others. So you begin to see what comes about. And since I didn't come here this afternoon to really get into the assassination picture too deeply, I wanted to set a stage for it. So let me jump to some of the things that we know about without having to dig too far under the surface. That in 1953 the CIA had a problem, only this time it was in the country of Iran. And Mossadegh died of lead poisoning, and the Shah, who was escaping to the Riviera, was brought back to resume the long 2,500-year line of Cyprus, King, uh, King uh, Cyrus, and now he leads the country of Iran at the pleasure of the agency's number one man in the world today, Richard Helms, who is called ambassador. And so as long as the guard in Iran can keep the Shah alive, he'll be our man there. And as long as the Shah is our man, he'd probably be alive. In Jordan, where King Hussein jets around and lives by grace of his elite guard, that guard has been trained through various corporate devices by the Central Intelligence Agency for at least 20 years. And King Hussein has about the same chances of surviving that Faisal or Hassan or the Shah have, and that is that if he plays the game, his guard will take care of him. These are important considerations because they're right there in the record. The thing is that we in this country don't think of it that way very often. You see, they don't have elections in many of these third tier countries. How do you replace somebody? This evening we'll hear some talk from uh, Mrs. Allende. Uh, how do you replace people in countries where there is not provision for election? The people in power hold the power until somebody else is strong enough to take it away. 
and that ability to take it away is a very fleeting thing sometimes, as it was in the case of Trujillo, or in the case of Diem. But in every case, there are many people willing to move in and become heads of state. And if the Guard, which is trained in many cases by our own CIA, part of their business, now many people write about that or know about it, but that's part of their prime business in the clandestine area, then the men have the defense that's necessary to keep them alive. Now, I'll close with an example that I think is an extremely pertinent one because it leads to what will follow me on this program, the case of No Din Diem. When Diem assumed the power in Vietnam, 1954, if you'll remember, his country had no antecedent. It was simply a piece of real estate lying south of some 17th parallel. When you take over a piece of real estate like that and begin to rule, who are your police? Who is your army? Who are your generals and who are your sergeants? Where is your power? This is important. Where is your power? Ed Lansdale, probably one of the best agents the agency ever set in motion, came over from the Philippines where he had created a man named Mag Sai Sai as president of the Philippines. Pretty good job, as far as that went. And he brought his team with him to Saigon. I happened to be pilot on that airplane. Went into Saigon with the same, what we used to call in quotes, Robin Hood technique, that if you can fool the people, you can fool the people. And Diem was created by a secret police trained by special forces, the Green Berets. In those days, I don't think they wore the Green Berets. Yeah, I'm talking about 55, 56, 57. And Diem owed his existence at the time to two clever maneuvers. One was the rapid placement of a good secret police, and secondly, the purchase of an army. Because if you remember, there were two armies in Cholon that were more or less mercenaries, and they purchased the army. Now, as long as Diem had that backing, he was in pretty good shape. By the summer of 1963, a summer that we all could write about and research about a lot more, that was a very important summer, there were papers coming across my desk. At that time, I was working in the office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Papers with no top secret stamps on them, no eyes only stamps on them, no register numbers on them. That meant they were really secret. And if they're really secret, you don't put anything on them. And a man would come up to you and he'd say, have you seen this? And it would say, we've had enough of Diem, what are we going to do about him? Well, just that idea means that it won't be long till the uh, bullets are flying. Because what happens in Saigon? Somebody like Lou Conine is told, hey, go check out the generals. Find out which general could take over the job. General Big Man or... The guy in Khan or he or he not ready, but Khan or Min might be ready. Check them out. The minute you tell people that in a city like Saigon, you could do it today. The minute you tell people that, they go back to their sources of power and they say, you know what? The United States is changing its policy. And it was changing its policy. And so you stand on a stack of Bibles. In fact, uh, Chuck Colson and Howard Hunt tried to rewrite the stack of Bibles to prove that it was Kennedy that said, shoot him. But nobody in Washington said, shoot Diem. You don't do an assassination that way. The way people are assassinated, assassinated is by taking away the power that has been created to keep them there. It's a lot easier that way. More interest to me than the genealogy of Lee Harvey Oswald and all the rest is, who said, let's go to Dallas, Jack? I understand that Kenny O'Donnell feels real bad about it. I understand that Bobby Kennedy had said from time to time he wished he'd have put his foot down. Jerry Bruno, the greatest advanced man in politics, went there, but did Jerry Bruno pick the route? Maybe Mark can tell you. Who did? Who decided, let's go to Dallas? You've been to Fort Worth, you've got to go to Dallas. That's important because whoever decided that knew some things. I have worked with the Secret Service in their good work to keep presidents alive. I went to Mexico City. 
when Eisenhower was going down in 1956. And I'll tell you, the Secret Service knows the game, like the guerrillas in France knew the game. They can keep the president alive. Where, where were they? How does it happen you can have a six-story building with a lot of empty floors, and they neither wired and sealed the doors as their manual says they will, nor had anybody on the roof with high-powered guns and with radios as their manual says they will, or had a man in Dealey Plaza to look at the man at the roof and to look at the windows as their manual says they will. And if you don't drive over 44 miles an hour, a nice figure, but it works out in tests, why did they bring that car down to a crawling speed? Those are more important to me than the genealogy of Lee Harvey Oswald and everybody else on the grassy knoll. I think I'll stop there. That's what I call the anatomy of assassination. It gets you thinking, you know? Well, thank you very much.